Welcome to the CBS Radio Mystery Theater Archives, the only YouTube channel which has the original classic episodes of the CBS Radio Mystery Theater in order with no ads. Thank you for listening, and now, enjoy the show. I'm E.G. Marshall. No man, said the historian, lives without jostling and being jostled. In all ways, he has to elbow himself through the world, giving and receiving offense. Is that what it's all about? Jostling, hustling, elbowing, shoving? A series of never-ending confrontations? In many ways, it seems to be true. And yet, we are told... The meek shall inherit the earth. Ah, what a world we live in. So filled with contradictions and infinite possibilities. Melisande, I had to see you. But it's dangerous for us to be seen together. It doesn't matter now. She knows the whole story. Edward, you have to be calm. Calm? I tell you, she's got us. Well, I, I don't care how bad it looks. There is a way out. No, she's got us. The old lady has got us dead. Oh, you're wrong. She's got us alive. Dead? She hasn't got us at all. Our mystery drama, The Coldest Killer, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Joan Lovejoy and Bob Reddick. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and x -Lax. I'll be back shortly with Act One. We die only once, and for such a long time. And so you would think that there would be nothing casual about death. Seemingly, we ought to go to any length to avoid it. Uh, but uh, we're getting ahead of our story. In the beginning, we have Joseph Nafferton and Edward Coffin, lifelong friends. Now in their late 30s, closer than ever. As a matter of fact, partners in business, and they are having dinner together, as usual. A happy party of three, Joe, Edward, and Melisande Nafferton, Joe's wife. No dessert for me. Well, that's the first sensible thing you've said all night, Joe. Uh, you tried to get Joe to go on a diet again. No, somebody has to do it, and really that somebody should be you. Oh, I've given up. Oh, but it's your wifely duty, Melisande. I think my wifely duty is to be pleasing and loving to my husband. <laughs> Which she is. And if you're constantly badgering and nagging at a man to do the right thing, you are well on your way to becoming a shrew. And now, the reason I'm not having dessert tonight is, A, I don't have time, and B, I'll have it later. Later? Oh, I have a boys' club thing tonight. Again? Well, it's a special tonight. They're giving me an award. And you didn't tell me. You didn't ask us to come. Well, how would it sound? Come to the boys' club tonight and watch me get an award. But I'd want to go and see you get a medal. Well, it isn't exactly a medal. More of a citation. Well, why didn't you tell me I'd have canceled my duplicate bridge session? Well, that's just it. After all, Edward, bridge is like... Well, like a religion to you. And this is just some little boys' club thing. Joe, you give your time, your energy, and your money to help these kids. Now, when a gesture of appreciation is being made, you call it nothing. Well, I'm going to phone Aunt Emma and tell her I can't stop by and see her tonight. Oh, but she's sick. Aunt Em? Oh, she's always sick. I'll get out of my bridge. Uh, no, no, please. Listen, there's no need. It'll just be coffee, cake, and ice cream, and some dull speeches. Oh, but Joe... Look, this award business is the least important, and the most important thing is the kids... To light one little candle in the darkness, Mel. It's more important that you visit your Aunt Emma tonight. And, Edward, you really don't want to miss your bridge game. Well, you seem determined to go by yourself. Well, it's just that... If I were a jealous, suspicious wife, which I am not, I might suspect an ulterior motive. What do you mean? Why do you want to be alone? Is there really a boys' club awards meeting tonight? <laughs> now, Melissa... A meeting, yes. 
but with a blonde brunette or redhead. Not even in a joke. <laughs> I can vouch for Joe. <laughs> so can I. Well, the thing starts at eight, and it's almost that now. Uh, it's on the south side. Uh, can you drop Melisande off, Edward? Sure. But will it be in the papers? <laughs> well, I don't think so. Why should it be in the papers? It isn't as if I killed anybody. Well, I'll see you at home, Melisande. Good night, Edward. Now, why do you think he doesn't want you or me at that meeting? Anything fishy, do you suppose? Oh, hardly. As far as Joe is concerned, what you see is what there is. He's extremely modest. He doesn't like to be the center of attention. If you or I were there, he'd really be embarrassed. Well, darling, it's a bonus. A bonus? Well, I didn't figure we'd have a chance to be together tonight. So, why don't we leave here right now? And make the most of it. Who? Well, certainly. Have her come right in, Miss Knight. Ah, Mrs. Nafferton. Won't you sit down? Thank you. Uh, Joseph isn't here. He left to attend the Chamber of Commerce luncheon. I am aware of that, Mr. Coffin. I am not here to see my son. Oh? Well, what can I do for you? Shall I come to the point? Well, I can't imagine what point you have in mind, but please do. If I may use current slang, which I detest, but which is nevertheless highly expressive, leave town. I beg your pardon? Why? Because you didn't hear what I said? Or because you do not choose to understand it. Leave town? I find that the most satisfactory solution to the problem. Problem? Two problems, actually, Mr. Coffin. First, you and Melisande have been... I must use the old-fashioned word, betraying Joe. Well, Mrs. Nath. Don't interrupt I have a report from private detectives. Private detectives? You keep interrupting, and for no purpose. Uh, is that water in the pitcher on your desk fresh? Well, certainly. May I trouble you for a cupful, please? I find it necessary to take a pill. Well, of course. Thank you. Well, you become all excited, and with your heart condition, that certainly is unwise. My... My pills are designed to control my condition. Thank you. Well, still, you should not needlessly... Admit. Shall we proceed? Well, you must take care of your heart. Uh, why should you be concerned? After all, to you and to my son's wife, I am a nasty, meddlesome old witch. Oh, now, Mrs. Knapp. Oh, yes. But to return to matters of substance. My detectives can furnish a list of places... Times, motels, etc., etc. Proof positive. Proof of your dalliance with your partner's wife. Do you wish to deny it? Where are we headed? Into, I fear, even deeper and more troubled waters, Mr. Coffin. In addition to your many attainments, you are also, I see, a student of history. Oh, you flatter me. You have constructed... A Potemkin village. Oh, now you lost me. The Russian Empress, Catherine the Great, had a prime minister named Potemkin. <laughs> Is he somehow involved in our little problem? Only as he served as your inspiration. It seems that he and his friends were, as you would put it, robbing the Empress blind. Therefore, he decided to convince her that the nation was happy and prosperous. Mrs. Navid, and I wish you would come to the point. This is the point. And he said to her, Your Majesty, let me show you how wisely your money is being spent, how prosperous your people are. Come, let us tour the realm. Well, surely this can have no bearing but on what... he prepared for that trip, Potemkin did. <laughs> now I know why Joe's father died. You talked him to death. All along the route, he constructed villages. Prosperous-looking villages, only they weren't really villages. The homes and buildings that lined the road the length of Russia were false fronts, like Hollywood movie sets. But you still haven't told and me... And so have you. You have constructed Potemkin villages. What are you talking about? You know what I'm talking about, Mr. Coffin. 
My son cares only about manufacturing, engineering, turning out those stupid plastic containers, the marketing, the distribution, the finances bore him. He leaves that all to you. Let any accountant examine the books of our firm. Oh, that is bravado. Why, you have set up four warehouses, north, south, east, and west. Each is a Potemkin building. Now, that, that is... A, a lie? Well, they're false fronts. They neither receive nor ship merchandise. But you charge rent and salaries and expenses on the books. Uh, I notice you don't interrupt me now. And, Mr. Coffin, it all goes into your own pocket. You have been systematically looting this company for years. Fraud. Deliberate fraud. Embezzlement. Very well. Proposed to do. And I haven't come to the worst of it. You and Melisande. You have been making plans to murder Joseph. Why would I want to kill Joseph? It doesn't make sense. Unfortunately, it makes a very grim kind of sense. From your point of view, he's the goose that lays the golden egg. Not indefinitely. You see, Mr. Coffin, the money is running out. Strong and profitable as the company was, it could not endure your depredations forever. Joe isn't aware of that. But the day of reckoning must soon be at hand. How would, um... How would killing Joe help? Insurance. Insurance for both you and Melisande. Melisande, as Joe's grieving widow, would be consoled by a quarter of a million dollars. And you and Joe have key man insurance taken out on each other. Now look, Mrs. Nathan, and we never could even attempt... Do to... you think you could ever collect insurance if the facts in my possession were presented to the insurance company? Why, you and Melisande would go to jail for life. All right, Mrs. Navadon. You have all the cards. What do you propose to deal? I have an airline ticket for you. And some money and a typewritten note. Read it. But I have no... Read it. I shall turn my findings over to the police. Dear Joe, we stumble in the darkness. Suddenly, we see a ray of light which reveals our true destiny. I feel I must go off to an undeveloped place and help those less fortunate than myself. Perhaps unconsciously, I absorbed it all from you. Goodbye, Joe, and God bless you. Now, sign that, please. But I... You have, have no choice. But... Your plane leaves at six o'clock. But Mrs. Nafferton... We'll put this in the mail. It will be on my son's desk Monday morning. Sign, please, Mr. Coffin. Ah. Thank you. And now, Edward, I bid you not au revoir, but farewell. <laughs> Edward? What are you doing here, Melisande? I thought it best not to see you at the office. She's got us, Mel. She's got us. Don't say that. We'll think of something. What? For crying out loud, what? You have to be calm. Calm? Calmer than you have ever been in all your life. Melisande, she's got us. I don't care how bad it looks. There has to be some way out. In that bag of hers were all the papers, all the documents that could send me to jail. I would be disgraced, ruined for life. Did you sign the note? I had to. Well, there's no real harm done if Joe never sees well, it. But I have to see it. You just get into the office earlier than he does and get to the mail first. But what is the good of it? If the old lady finds out that I haven't left the country, she'll, she'll reveal everything. Not necessarily. How can you say that? She's got us. The old lady has got us dead. Ah, that's where you're wrong. She's only got us alive. Dead? She doesn't have anything at all. What are you saying, Melisande? What are you saying? Oh, come now, Edward. You know what she's saying. And if you don't, every man, woman, and child in our audience could tell you. 
We play fair on this show. When somebody has to be done in to advance our plot, why, we do them in. And furthermore, the graduate students in our little seminars here already know how it's going to be done. Every clue was in plain view. I shall return shortly with Act Two. Hatred comes from the heart, contempt from the head. And neither feeling is quite within our control. Well, now, a man who is having an affair with his best friend's wife is surely a man who has plenty of hatred and contempt. And so, for that matter, does the wife. And when you get enough hatred and contempt going for you, the natural result is usually murder, isn't it? What are you saying, Melisande? Mrs. Nafferton has to go. Go? You don't mean murder? Yes. She has to be killed. Well, how can you say it so... so calmly? I'm merely stating a fact. There's no point in getting emotional about it. But to... to kill somebody... We've already decided we have to kill Joe. Well... We have no choice. If we kill Joe and leave her alive, she'll go to the police. We'll have killed Joe for nothing. Listen to us. This conversation, people like us don't have conversations like this. Conversations about committing murder, not law-abiding people like us. But we're not law-abiding people, Edward. We have already violated a clear majority of the Ten Commandments, not to mention how many man-made statutes. But to kill an old lady... It's easier... I never realized you could talk this way, Melissa. She's old. She's sick. We'd be depriving her of very little. Well, I... I'm against it. Does that mean you'd rather end everything between you and me? Well, you know I don't want to do that. I know there's only one way for us to continue to be together, and you won't take it. Melissa. Yes. You were about to say. But how? 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 We haven't even figured a way to kill Joe, and now this. Oh, this. <laughs> this is going to be very simple. Simple? Absolutely no trouble at all. She has a very severe heart condition. The slightest shock, or stress, or strain could trigger an incident. You know that? Yes, yes, I know that. Now, she's fortunate. She keeps her condition well controlled with her special medication. I don't know exactly what it is, but it's a pill. I still don't understand. She carries a vial of those pills constantly in her handbag. Well? Suppose we could substitute other pills. Poison. Sugar. <laughs> There's nonsense about poison. Don't be a fool. If there's an autopsy, do you want it to reveal poison? No. Sugar. Instead of the real thing. And it will appear that one of the attacks just carried her off, despite her pills. But, Mel... These things do happen. And we are in the clear. But how do we substitute the sugar pills? Oh, I've already taken care of that. You've what? I've already made the substitution. You have? How? When? Mother Navidon invited me over for lunch today. She informed me of her plan for you and me. At that split second, I knew it would have to be done. But when? Fortune, as the saying goes, favors the brave. She was called to the telephone. That instant, I took the vial from her purse and emptied the pills into my own. But where did you get sugar pills with which to replace them? My darling, don't I always carry a little bottle of saccharin tablets? Now, if anything should trigger another attack... And she takes one of what she thinks is her pills. It won't... It won't... Precisely. It won't do her a bit of good. But it will do us all the good in the world. And all we have to do is wait for an attack. No. No, we can't afford to wait. She may be days, weeks, even months without it. Well, what can we do? We can give her one. Now, what are you talking about? We'll go to her and... Make sure she has one. Well, that's murder. Of course. 
Where do we have to go? I want you to have your share in this murder. I switch the pills. You will do the rest. But I don't know what to do. I'll uh, spell it out on the way home. Hello, Mother Nupperton. Well, Melisande. And Edward? How do you do, Mrs. Nafferton? Your plane leaves within the hour. It wasn't necessary for you to say goodbye. Oh, he hasn't come to say goodbye. He hasn't? No. Well, tell her why you've come, Edward. Well, I, um... Go ahead. Tell her, Edward. Tell her or you're through. All right. I'm not going. You're not going? No, I'm not going. I told you what would happen. Well, I don't believe you. Well, you think I'm bluffing? Every step of the way. Well, I, I could call my attorney right now. I'll dial the number for you. The moment I place these facts in his possession... Well, what are you waiting for? Well, you face jail. And what do you face? Ruin me. Go ahead, ruin me. Uh, I will. Please, please, Mother Navitan. You cannot afford this excitement. You keep out of this. If it weren't for you, you're the Jezebel. The harlot who's ruined both of them. You bewitched one and seduced the other. Expose me. Expose her. Flaunt our sins and my crimes for the world to see. Will your darling Joe thank you for it? Love you for it? Don't you think he knows? No. Yes, yes, in his heart he knows. That isn't true. He is nothing but a worthless, timid weakling. Don't you dare talk that way about my son. And it's your fault. It's how you raised him. Get out. Get out. I dare you. I'm tell going him. to call the police. Well, let me do it for I you. I will. <laughs> water. Give me some water. There's a pitcher on the table, Edward. And, and a, a glass. My pills. My, my, right my here. pills. Here, let, let me. I don't want any help from you. I get my pills myself. My pills. There. And now, I feel better in a minute. Oh, it should stop. The pain should stop immediately. It should stop. Melison. Melison, call Dr. Spurlock. Call Dr. Spur. <laughs> Is, uh... Is she dead? Yes. How can you tell? The old bag. She was dead before she hit the floor. Well, what do we do now? Edward, you are magnificent. You killed her. We, we killed her. Always remember that, Edward. Always remember that. Now, what do we do? Well, my darling mother-in-law has had one of her attacks. I'd better call Dr. Spurlock. Melisande, I happen to remember. Dr. Spurlock is also the coroner for this county. She died of a heart attack. Oh, I'd better take care of the pills. The pills? Well, in the very unlikely event that Dr. Spurlock might look at the bottle, I'd better put the real ones back. I, uh, you think of everything, Melisande. In the game we're playing now, Edward, we have to think of everything. Be ready for anything. And overlook nothing. She... She, she suddenly started gasping for breath. She was in pain. Was she able to take her pill? Oh, oh yes, Doctor. Edward got her a glass of water, and, and she took the pill out of the vial in her bag, and, and she drank it down. And then what happened? Well, she, um, she, she, she closed her eyes, and she sighs, the way she usually does. Did. And we thought that would be the end of it, the way it usually was. Yes? This time, instead of getting better immediately, she she she, she seemed to get worse, and, and she just died. Melisande, are you sure she took her pill? Oh, yes, yes. We saw her, didn't we, Edward? Absolutely. You say she took the pill from this little vial? Y yes, Doctor. Why? It's funny. These pills have a slightly bitter odor. 
You can always smell it on the breath for several minutes after the patient takes them. But uh, I couldn't detect any such odor of it on her. Uh, how, uh, how long after she took a pill was it till you called me? It was almost immediately, Doctor. That's how fast it happened. And you were here less than ten minutes later. Yes. Well, in that time, the odor could have dissipated. Are, um, are you going to perform an autopsy, Doctor? An autopsy? Whatever for? She was a very sick old lady, and she obviously died of a massive heart attack. Autopsy? What, what do you think this is, a detective story? Uh, sh shall you need us for anything else, Doctor? No, no. This must have been a traumatic experience for both of you. Edward, why don't you take her out for a breath of fresh air? We got away with it. Did we? Well, of course. We did everything just right. You heard what Dr. Spurlock said. She died of a heart attack. And that's it. Ended. Finished. Case closed. You know, for the very first time, I'm letting myself believe it. Believe what? That we can do it. That we can carry the whole thing off. Well, now we'd better get ready for Joe. Joe. Edward, the company can't last another six months. All we have going for us is that insurance. It won't be as easy as this one was. The best way to do it is to do it. What do you mean? With a gun. A gun? At night, late. Shoot him. Well, I couldn't do that. Take his watch, his ring, and wallet. The police will write it off as a robbery. What's the idea of a gun? What, what'll I do if it won't go off, if I miss him? Look, the best way is the most simple way. All we have to do is make it look like a robbery. But it won't work. Edward, I know you're frightened. Maybe. But I'm also being smart. Let me tell you something about the police. You don't know anything about the police. Whenever a man dies in suspicious circumstances, do you know who the police suspect automatically? His wife. His business associates. But we have to kill him. We have no choice. It can't be murder. How else can we kill him? Maybe it could appear to be... an accident. What kind of an accident? Well, I don't know. Wait a minute. I know how it has to be done. I know the only safe, sure, and successful way to kill Joseph. You realize, of course, he's talking about his best friend and her beloved husband. What people we have in this world. And these folks have already gotten away with one murder. Is there no justice? No retribution? Well, there's a third act, and I shall deliver it shortly. Practice, they say, makes perfect. Or if you want the original quote, practice is the best instructor. Well, obviously, practice improves practically everyone. Tennis players, golfers, piano players, doctors. Oh, yes, doctors. They practice all the time. But what does practice do for murderers? We'll get someone else to do it. Are you talking about a hired killer? That's the way it's usually done, isn't it? By whom? By people who need to have a murder committed. But do you realize that such a man could blackmail us for the rest of our lives? How? It's a job. We pay him, and that's the end of it. How could he blackmail us? He'd have to admit his own guilt. No, I've thought this out very carefully. It's the only way that makes sense. But you yourself said when a man dies in suspicious circumstances, the police are bound to suspect his wife and friend. Ah, but since neither you or I will have to be there to pull the trigger, we can arrange to be somewhere else. Huh. You really are quite inventive. All right, let's arrange for this thing immediately. Arrange? Yes, let's hire someone. I I'm convinced it's a splendid idea. Yes. Well. What's the matter? Well, it's a splendid idea, all right. And nothing is the matter. 
In theory. Then what is the problem? All we have to do is get a hired killer. Yes, I understand. But how do we hire one? Well, the, the underworld is full of them. Yes, but where is the underworld? Well, it's all around you. Gambling, loan sharking, protection rackets. It's even taken over respectable businesses. But how do I find it? What I'm trying to say is we've got a practical problem. We want to hire a killer. We can't advertise in the classifieds. Well, we just... Just... Uh... Just what? Ask around? Go looking in some shady dive? Approach some villainous-looking character? Are you telling me it's impossible to hire a killer? I'm telling you we don't know how to go about it. But we have no other way. The business insurance policy Joe and I have on each other is only good if the business is ongoing. In six months, we'll be bankrupt. All right. The idea of having someone else do it is basically good. Now, if we can't get someone to do it, why can't we get someone to be blamed for doing it? You mean to, um... frame somebody? That's as good a word as any. Well, once again, who? Doesn't Joe have any enemies? Enemies? I can't think of anyone who doesn't like him. Oh, that's impossible. Somebody has to dislike him. Well, look at you and me. We're going to kill him, but even we like him. Well, we have to kill him somehow. And it has to be done right away. I like the club at this hour of the morning. Yes, it is nice, Joe. You know what I like best about it? No one's here. The pool is empty. You can play tennis without anyone getting edgy about you taking extra time on the court. And the locker room is nice and quiet. Well, I always thought you liked to be with a lot of people. Maybe I've changed. Ever since Mom died. Ah, well, now what do you say we have a drink? Well, let me call Pete. No, he's never around when you need him. Pete? Hey, Pete. He's probably goofing off somewhere. No, he's around somewhere. Joe, what's wrong? Uh, I don't know. Losing mom took something out of me. Like what? Oh, like... Like I used to do a lot of things because I figured mom would like them. I got all involved with community projects and stuff like that. And you seem to enjoy them. I didn't really. I don't enjoy them now. They all feel like a waste of time. Didn't you say... Light one little candle in the darkness? You know what happens to that one little candle? <laughs> The wind blows it out. I understand how you feel. Empty because of your mother. No. No, I'm going back to being me. Thinking about myself, my wife, my business. I've been neglecting them. Shamefully, Eddie. I don't even know what shape we're in. Well, we're, we're in pretty good shape. Oh, it's a disgrace. We've had those new warehouses. I've never even been to see them. We ought to go on a, on a trip next week. Okay. You shoulder too much of the load. From now on, I'm doing my share. Well, you don't really have to you feel... You gentlemen called me? Oh, uh, Pete. Yeah, we called you about five minutes ago. Well, Mr. Nafford and I, I was in a kitchen. No, it wasn't five minutes ago, Joe. Uh, Pete, the usual for Mr. Nafford and me. You can skip me, Pete. Is something wrong, Mr. Nafford? You're going to make drinks? Look at your hands. Those fingernails. Oh, Joe, part of Pete's job is to shine everyone's shoes, too. I, I, I wash my hands all before right, I make right, drinks. Take off. Please, Mr. Nafferton, don't be sore at me. Will you get out of here? If, if I'm doing something wrong, let me know. The, the gentlemen are starting to come in. And, You're uh, bothering me. But if they hear you yelling at me, they'll figure I've done something wrong and I might get fired. Look, I don't want to be annoyed. Something well, wrong here, Mr. Nafferton? But can't you, as the club steward, see to it that we get some intelligent attendance? Well, of course. I'm sorry you're so upset. Pete, you're through here at the end of the week. You, you mean I'm fired? That's right. Yeah, but, but, but I need a job. Well, I'm sorry. Well, sorry. I got a wife and kids to feed. Mr. Nafferton, I hope you're satisfied with yourself. That's enough, Pete. You, you, you phony. With, with, with all your good works. Now, Pete, don't bother to finish the week. Get your money and leave. You don't deserve to live. Why, I'll... Look out. You... Look out. Uh, that's all right, gentlemen. I've got him. I like to kill him. You ain't gonna kill nobody. Let go of my arm. You walk nice and easy and keep your mouth shut, and then I'll let go of your arm. I, I don't know what got into me. It's just that for so long I've, I just tolerated all kinds of. Well, I, I've given so much of myself to others. Well, that's no reason to go to the other extreme. Well, it's just that Pete has always offended me with his dirty hands. I, 
I was always afraid to complain because he'd be fired. Well, it's it's not my problem, it's his. Well, why don't you forget it? Better still, stretch out, have a nap. This is the best time of day for it. Well, damn it, if he's so worried about his wife and kids, he, he should learn to wash his hands. Don't you see? It's another perfect setup. Just like we had with Mother Nafferton. What do you mean? Like the pills, the kind of thing that just falls into your lap. We have the ready-made Patsy. Pete. He has the motive. He was heard to threaten Joe. But, but how... Ah, now you're asking how. First, ask where. I'll answer in the clubhouse. At ten in the morning, when the place is practically deserted. But Pete will have to be seen there, and he's been fired. No problem, I'll get him there. How? Leave it to me. Now. For the murder weapon. A gun? Guns scare the daylights out of me. Besides, no one should hear the shot. Well, then what can you use? A weapon that will never be found. That's the beauty of it. What do you mean, it will never be found? I read about this in a couple of stories. You make a dagger. A sharp, pointed instrument out of liquid carbon dioxide. What? Dry ice. Dry ice? I bought a small cylinder of CO2 gas. Okay? When you release it, it forms a solid kind of snow that you can mold into a pointed stick. A sharp, pointed stick. But why? Why not use a knife? Because you stab him with this, it enters the body, and then it melts and disappears. Oh, I see. Will it stay hard enough while you're in the clubhouse? It, it's warm in the locker room. I'll carry it in my bag. The one I use for my tennis things. Only I'll have the bag packed with more dry ice. Dagger made of dry ice. Can it work? It has to work. No way to ever find what the weapon was. A and Pete? The fact that they'll never find the weapon will only make them grill him harder. Make them more positive he's lying when he claims to be innocent. But you still have to get him to the clubhouse. That's no problem at all. Hello? Pete? If this is Edward Coffin, um, would you come back to work at the club? Well, well I've been fired, Mr. Coffin. Well, Mr. Navin was sick about what he did to you. He couldn't sleep all night. He's not been well since his mother's death. Yes, sir. He feels he owes you an apology. Could you come by the clubhouse this morning at 10 o'clock? Mr. Nafferton will fix everything up. Oh, thank you, Mr. Coffin. Thank you. You, you. you just saved my life. Not a bad game. Well, I think you overextended yourself, Joe. Yeah. Well, I think I'll stretch out on the bench and just grab a nap. Go ahead. Well, don't let me sleep more than 20 minutes, will you? No, I won't. You're a good friend, Eddie. Best friend... A guy could have. Joe? Joe? I'm not going to wake you in 20 minutes. Nobody is ever going to be able to wake you again. Hi, Mr. Coffin. The usual? All right. Mr. Nafton been along soon? I don't know. He likes a little nap after playing. He'll be along in a couple of minutes. Um, hey, Pete, what are you doing here? I thought I told Mr. you... Mr. Nafferton. He says he wants to see me. He says maybe we can work something out. Well, Pete, he's back in the locker room. You might tell him to hurry if he wants to ride back to the office with me. Oh, yes, sir. I, I, I will. I will. What got Mr. Nafferton so sorry, Pete, anyway? Just nerves, I guess. I wonder what's keeping Joe Nafferton... Listen, I have to make a phone call. Would you mind going back there? Oh, sure thing. Any minute now, we'll hear a yell that could awaken the dead. If such a thing were possible. Police! Police! Someone call the police. Mr. Nafferton's been murdered. A late news bulletin. Pete Mulray, clubhouse handyman, wanted for the murder of Joseph J. Nafferton, has been captured by the police. The accused insists he is innocent, that Mr. Nafferton was already dead when he found him in the clubhouse. Asked why he ran away, 
Mulray said he lost his head and feared he would be accused of the crime. Mulray was heard to threaten Mr. Nafferton's life the day before. The police are still searching for the murder weapon. Well, now, that's a neatly tied package. I never realized it would be so easy. He was fast asleep. I took the pointy little dry ice rod out of the bag and just stabbed it into his heart without even thinking. The part that went in broke off. The other part I put back in the bag, and that's all. You expecting someone? No, I'll see. Or Dr. Spurlock. May we come in? Edward, Melisande. May I present Police Lieutenant Dreyfus. Homicide. H- homicide? He's here to arrest you for the murder of Joseph Nafferton. What? A shame. We can't have you also for the murder of Mrs. Nafferton, his mother. But we could never prove that. What are you talking about? You said she took that heart pill. She never did. But there was nothing I could do about it. But here we've got you, uh, if you'll excuse a bad pun, cold. Why didn't you use an ordinary knife? No, you had to be fancy. I don't know what you're talking about. Dry ice. You're a fool. Tissue that's been pierced by ice shows a different traumatic pattern than tissue pierced by steel. You can tell it's been frozen. Well, I deny it. I don't know what you... You thought you had some super device, some foolproof way. But Pete Mulray killed him for revenge. I asked Lieutenant Dreyfus here to get a warrant to search this place. Edward... Do you know what he found? A cylinder of CO2 gas. Why, Edward? Why would he find liquid CO2 in your house? You're not required to say anything. But does a happy explanation occur to you? No, sir. Not even an unhappy explanation occurred to him. They were very quiet, Edward and Melisande. What a fumbling, stumbling pair they were. But isn't that all to the good? After all, if all murderers were clever, none of them would ever be caught. I'll be back shortly. So much of what we believe is fashioned by the popular literature of our day. And so, crime and punishment are usually images of reality. In many cases, fantastic shadows of the actual thing. The truth is, if you're an average person who wants to commit a murder, you would hardly know how to go about it in real life. And if you imitated art, well, just remember, the gimmicks you read about in books and see on the screen and hear on this program are parts of crime's that have already been solved. Our cast included Joan Lovejoy, Bob Reddick, Lloyd Batista, Joan Shea, and Gilbert Mack. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by x and Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time... Pleasant dreams. I hope you enjoyed this episode of CBS Radio Mystery Theater. If you've enjoyed this and want to hear more, 